is um, the speaker last night, somewhat like you know forget uh, for this uh, classes at the hotel last night. An assistant to the president of Jolan Thorne University and a faculty member of the College of Communication Studies to moderate this session. Floor is yours. Thank you. Professor Yuan, thank you very much for the introduction. Everyone had a good time, good dinner, and good sleep last night. Just checking. So uh, today I'm going to be a little bit changing gear from yesterday as a big picture overview, right? More into a case study. We're looking into a uh, specific case. And the very first section this very morning would be talking about uh, SDG 3, which is a good health and well-being. And uh, I have an honor to introduce uh, three uh, world experts. Like on this very topic, we have Professor uh, Kao Professor uh, here with us, uh, Professor Carol Jacker, and Professor Shirley uh, I have been uh, ordered by Stephanie over there not to read through all the Bible, so we can spend uh, time focusing more on the content on the presentation. And just uh, give everyone the outline a bit so we know what's going to be going on in the next one and a half hour. Uh, each Presenter will have 15 minutes of time to present and share their work with you, right? And then uh, going to be three time one thing right at five minutes, two minutes, and then I will show aside, show that the time is already up, right? And then after this three presentation, we will start with Q and A. Probably a few rounds Q and A, and then we have this presenter, this speaker to give a concluding remark. Much, uh, take home uh, point for the one minute. Yes, I think we should be uh, doing well with this one and a half hours. So uh, let's begin with the first presentation. We have Professor Kelsey here with us. He's going to be uh, talking about uh, rural and urban health disparities among older adults in South Africa. Uh, I have been told not to read through the Bible, but it would be good to share with you a bit that Professor Kersey had been in Thailand for more than five years, right? Working at Makidon University. So he may be having more uh, experience with working in Thailand than myself. Uh, and he told me that at the very moment, uh, I should not be allowed to disclose to a specific uh, a little bit, uh, having more time regarding chronological time, right, when we're talking about measuring uh, age here, yeah, seem to be very active and young, <laughs> concerning like health, well being, right? So, Professor, Professor, please. Uh, well, the aging process is declined, associated with the decline of health status, physical functioning, cognitive functioning, and so on. For uh, and uh, there are social determinants also at play, uh, which may be socioeconomic, but it may also be rural urban differences which may play a role. And uh, it would be in uh, social demographic factors, in healthcare access, health status, and maybe prevalence and chronic conditions which may differ between rural and urban residents in all the adults. Some examples here, in, uh, for example in China, one study they found that the younger and more likely to women, widows, lower education and lower income were in the rural area, while in South Africa the prevalence of hypertension, diabetes is lower in the rural area. And urban residence is often associated with better health access, okay, health access in terms of hospital admission and so on, transport and so on and so forth. We have, in terms of uh, health status, there's a number of studies who found that the overall health status and quality of life was lower in rural urban, rural older adults than urban adults. Cognitive functioning or cognitive impairment also lower. The Functional limitation 
there are different outcomes. We have in China, it's uh, higher, but in, uh, in, in uh, Bangladesh it is lower. Scopopenia is higher. So there are differences in different studies in terms of health status. In terms of the chronic conditions, uh, urban residents, uh, there is a higher prevalence of asthma in a number of studies, lung disease, cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, and so on. Of course, underweight malnutrition is maybe more likely in rural areas, uh, overweight or obesity higher in uh, urban areas in Iran, South Africa, but lower in the USA. Uh, oral health, uh, the complete tooth loss. Uh, Edentourism was higher in, uh, in the uh, urban area in Ghana. On mental health, there are different uh, studies, in terms of depression, for example, whether it's lower or higher in urban residents. Uh, the health risk behaviors, uh, some studies they show that maybe urban residents uh, is uh, more alcohol use and uh, less. Uh, physical activity, they become more sedentary. Uh, but in India, for example, the vodka use was less in urban residents than the rural. Uh, so we looked at the urban health differences in all the others, and there is lack of studies in African continents, and we looked at South Africa using the cross section data from the first data set of the SAGE. Uh, WHO study uh, of uh, and looked at 50 years and above. And uh, these are the measures, the health risk behaviors uh, on tobacco use, physical uh, inactivity, problem drinking, food and vegetable consumption, health status, grip stance, functional disability, cognitive functioning, quality of life, chronic conditions, some of them self-report, some of them measured, arthritis, asthma, lung disease, depression, obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular, dentalism, anxiety, sleeping problems, hypertension, and uh, vision. So we look at each of the health status outcomes or chronic condition outcomes and then adjusted the model uh, uh, with the social demographic factors and the health risk behaviors. Um, the urban rural difference in terms of the exposure variables of social demographic and, uh, was that uh, rural residents uh, was much lower education and lower wealth status. Uh, and, uh, but there was no difference in terms of the health risk behaviors, tobacco use, problem drinking, and so on and so forth, uh, between rural, rural and urban uh, residents. This is the prevalence of the health status variables and the chronic conditions, and uh, these are the outcomes uh, in the model where uh, we we, we hardly find any differences. Let's say that up front, that uh, uh, and, uh, we had some discussion yesterday that, well, uh, yeah, as researchers, we always look for positive findings and we want to publish for the, uh, maybe a bias. So again, <laughs> it's important to report and study also that if there are no differences or no significant findings. So in terms of health status, we have only cognitive functioning, which is higher in the urban than in the rural. Uh, but the other, other indicators like grip strength, quality of life, and so on and forth, didn't differ uh, between urban and rural residents. Chronic conditions, the whole list here from arthritis, asthma, lung disease, hypertension, obesity, it wasn't significant. Underweight. Uh, Diabetes, yes, this was higher, prevalence was higher in the urban residents, uh, while uh, the remaining, well, no, no, sorry, edentourism was also higher in the urban residents, uh, while the other ones, uh, including the mental health, depression, anxiety, sleep problems, didn't differ between uh, rural and urban. 
So we found well in line with a number of other studies that rural rural other all the others have less education and were less wealthy than the urban residents, uh, which could mean that uh, they may have less access to healthcare because of those socioeconomic factors, uh, and that could be a factor to improve healthcare access by improving those factors. Uh, we found the cognitive function was higher in the urban areas, but this was very much in link to the higher education of the urban residents. And also, some argue the cognitive functioning tests, which the WHO we have used, uh, is a little bit biased towards those who have education, that they perform better on those tests uh, on, uh, when they have education. And, um, <coughs> Health status and quality of life didn't differ, although we have other studies that found that uh, this was related to probably lower socioeconomic status and higher unemployment. Uh, and, uh, but we have diabetes and naturalism, which was also found in some other studies, which was higher in urban residents. And for diabetes, it could be that hazardous behaviors play a role here, that uh, the changes of physical inactivity and the dietary changes, uh, or the question of access to healthcare diagnosis is different. Uh, that probably is the case, but we, we didn't find the, the hazardous behaviors to be different between urban and rural residents. But, uh, so maybe it's more the healthcare access or being diagnosed uh, earlier uh, in, in the urban setting. Similarly, with, with uh, edentalism, it could be that urban residents increase more consumption of uh, refined sugars, which may lead to caries or tooth loss, uh, and uh, they may have better access to dental care services and tooth attractions are more likely to be available in the urban than in the rural areas, which may explain some of these differences. Again, underweight and obesity, we didn't find uh, differences. And uh, similar with the mental health indicators, uh, we didn't find the differences. Uh, and again, also with the health risk behaviors, uh, <coughs> the tobacco use, problem drinking, and so on and so forth, they differ between urban and rural residents. Which could mean that the risk, those risk behaviors, they have penetrated both into urban and rural areas, or let's say in rural areas as well, not only in urban areas. So that intervention should also target them equally, the rural and urban areas in terms of improving on their, on their health behaviors. I have some slides, we did this on the gender differences as well, but that is maybe for discussion. So as a conclusion, we found some uh, rural urban health dis disparities in this study, uh, which was the, uh, uh, the higher prevalence of diabetes, dentalism, cognitive functioning uh, in, in the urban uh, residents. Uh, and, uh, and yet, understanding some of those rural urban differences may help in improving access to, to health care in, in uh, South Africa. Thank you very much. Professor uh, Kersai, thank you very much for the presentation. I think this would give us a very good uh, material to uh, discuss during the Q&A time. Uh, again, my boss over there, Stephanie, told me it's okay to take a few short uh, questions if it's like right on the definition or specific thing. If not, we can hold that a little bit until the, the very end. So, is there any quick comments, question for Professor Closer? Yeah, please. Uh, Yeah, please. At the front. If you 
could uh, introduce yourself, please, and you can give the one. Yeah, we're Harrison from uh, Can you can you just say a few words about the definition of urban and rural in South Africa? Because some of the homelands in South Africa are kind of mixed urban and rural areas. Well, after the independence, there was no longer homelands in South Africa, but it's the, it's the population uh, census uh, definitions which I usually have to check up again what they are because uh, uh, what urban municipalities and what rural municipalities are is probably is this, the size of the uh, population, size, which matters, I don't exactly know. Uh, how much it, it is, so I uh, have to take that for. Is there any uh, question on the clarification and definition? So, uh, if, if not, then may have an honor to invite Professor Carol Jacker here from the Newcastle University to give a presentation on health and dependency. Uh, I that the trainer, uh, prefer to presentation from the podium, yes, right? Then make sure that you give it a quick turn.
free of disability at this side, um, with disability in red. And then the third line is the morbidity uh, line, so chronic diseases. And so this blue area is the uh, uh, years spent uh, with chronic diseases but without disability. And then the red is the years spent with disability. And in compression, what we're trying to do is push these two lines closer to that mortality line to reduce the years spent, the red and the blue areas. But of course, when Free started um, this idea of compression uh, of, of morbidity, uh, he imagined that this mortality curve would be relatively stationary, and it isn't. So we're pushing against something that's moving. So we have to push these faster than the life expectancy. And that's basically what compression is. And expansion is if the opposite is happening. If this mortality curve is moving, uh, rectangularizing quicker uh, than these two are moving towards it, so that those areas are getting bigger. Um, so first of all, thinking uh, about uh, the compression of morbidity and different health measures. And I'm going to use as an example here uh, the cognitive function and aging study. And why am I using those two studies? Well, they were uh, complete uh, populations aged 65 and over, so including care homes, people aged 65 and over, at two time points, 1991 and 2011, so 20 years apart. And the first study had six centres, uh, but three were carried over into 2011. So I'm just comparing the three that are in both of those, uh, both of those time points. And I'm going to look first at three health measures, uh, one based on cognitive function, so I'm going to look at cognitive impairment, free life expectancy, uh, another based on self-reported health, uh, so cognitive function, um, assessed using the mini mental state examination, so that's a, an objective, relatively objective measure. Healthy life expectancy based on celebrated health, the usual general question. Disability free life expectancy based on instrumental and basic activities of daily living. Um, so I'll use those three to, to show that the measure of health matters. And then I'll introduce this dependency free life expectancy measure, the new one. So all the graphs I'm going to show, or most of them, are going to be like this. So I'm going to take a minute just to explain what these graphs show. Um, and basically they show the gain in years lived um, in, with particular health conditions, so with health or without or unhealthy, um, over that 20 year period. Um, and so for men, um, between 91 and 2011, men aged 65 gained four and a half years life expectancy. So a man aged 65 in 2011 could expect to live four and a half years more than, uh, on average, that a uh, man aged 65 in 1991. Um, and there was a gain of 4.2 years in cognitive impairment free life expectancy. So a man aged 65 in 2011 lived just over four years more uh, free of cognitive impairment than uh, the same man aged 65 did in 91. And so that didn't, that's not quite kept pace, but the, the years with uh, cognitive impairment, uh, there was a non-significant increase in those. The picture for women, though, is much more positive, and there was a real compression of um, cognitive impairment for women because women gained more years free of cognitive impairment than they did life expectancy, and there was a real reduction of about uh, 0.7 of a year, just under one year, um, of years with um, cognitive impairment. So that shows a compression, at least for women. For healthy life expectancy, still quite a positive picture. Um, again, 4.5, 3.6 years total life expectancy gained over that period. But the years healthy, uh, the years in good health, um, did not 
cheap pace, and there was a significant increase in unhealthy years of just over half a year for men and women. But the proportion of life spent healthy still increased over that time. So that's a relative compression. Now the bad news. The picture for disability is um, not as positive at all. It's not bad for men. Um, it's not as good as healthy life expectancy. It's certainly not good as cognitive impairment free life expectancy. But it's, there's still um, a, a significant increase of two, just over two and a half years in years free of disability. But an increase of just under two years with disability. But for women, there was very little increase in years free of disability over that period. So there was a real expansion of disability in both cases, but the majority of years for women gained were years with disability. Now, because of the measure of disability that we had, we had a measure of severity. So we had instrumental and uh, basic activities of daily living, and we can split those up. Um, and if you imagine those red bars, um, the 1.9 and the 3.1, separated into mild years free of mild disability and years free of moderate and severe disability, what you can see is that the good news, if there's any good news in this message, um, is that the most of those years were years with mild disability rather than moderate severe disability. So there was an increase of just about half a year in moderate severe disability. So the take home message is that compression expansion depends crucially on what measure of health you're using. We've got a real compression with cognitive impairment and we've got an expansion with disability and we've got something sort of in between uh, with self-rated health questions. Um, so then thinking about uh, measures of, of care needs, and I'm thinking very much here about being a bit more explicit in, in um, care, because um, that's what policy makers need, they need to know the amount of care required. Um, and disability, just using a cutoff of two or more ADLs, or something like that, doesn't really give you a, a full picture of how much care somebody will need. Um, if, if that's taken from administrative data, then that too is, is not really need, it's met demand. Um, and so we've used now quite a, a, an old method devised by a geriatrician, Bernard Isaacs, back in the 1970s, called the interval of need measure. Um, and what that does is it takes um, activities of daily living but also cognitive impairment and incontinence, both of which are um, strong predictors of need for care, and it puts them into categories um, based on the last time required before which help is required. So if you have severe cognitive impairment, or you're often incontinent and need help dressing, or you can't get to the toilet without help, then you're classified as having high dependency, uh, potentially requiring 24-hour care. Uh, whereas something like low dependency requires help less than daily, and is mainly the sort of instrumental um, activities of daily living, like shopping. Uh, and if you satisfy none of those, then you're independent. Remember, this is a measure of health required. The other disability measure was difficulty with ADL. So it might be that somebody has mild disability um, on the other measure, but is classified as independent on this measure because they don't require help. So that's quite important to think about it too. And if we look at the same graph for the measures of the exact measure of dependency, then it sort of reflects the disability um, that most of the increase was in independence and care less than daily for men, um, but that most of the, the uh, predominant uh, increase was in, in low level dependency for women. 
with very with not significant increase in years spent depression. Um, and for both of them, just under one year with 24 hour care, high dependency for men, and just over one year for women. So that's the change between 91 and 2011. So what's going to happen in the future? What are the care needs um, of older populations in the future going to look like? <coughs> and for this, um, <coughs> I'm using a new micro simulation model that we've developed as part of a, a project, interestingly, uh, um, with Professor Hussain's uh, colleague uh, at LSD, um, called the Population Aging and Care Simulation Model. And um, I'm not going to describe it in detail, so don't panic if you're not technically um, inclined. Um, but what I should say is that it takes the three national uh, population longitudinal studies as the base population and it includes people aged 35 and over so that we have the real health of uh, people as they're aging into the older population. So we can give a full picture of the 65 and over population over um, a 30 year period. Um, and then we've got um, a large number of chronic conditions because I was interested in comorbidity. The project was based around dementia, but I was also interested in what the, if the picture would look like of comorbid conditions with dementia. And last of all, uh, we've got our measure of dependency, the same sort of measure of dependency uh, as we have in the other. And what the micro simulation model does is it uses um, the, the uh, transition probabilities of these characteristics developed from the longitudinal uh, data here and applies it to this base population um, to, to um, artificially age, if you like, um, the population. Um, and so this is what the picture is going to uh, look like between 2015 and 2035, so another 20 year period. Um, and again, I'm using the same sort of colours, so men on, on average age 65 are going to um, have an increase of about three and a half years life expectancy, but they're going to gain more years independent. So the picture's looking really quite promising for men um, uh, over that 20 year period, the older uh, male population. And they're going to have a, a reduction in the level of medium and high dependency care required. The picture for women is very similar to what it was in the past um, and is not at all as positive. There's going to be an increase in years with high dependency and the majority of these um, uh, gain in life, in, in life expectancy is going to be with low level dependency. So just thinking about um, this is the picture in 2015. Oh, I'm sorry, my colour doesn't seem to have come out here. Um, I wanted to show you this again just to say that um, what the solution is, is to try and reduce the progression from independent to low level dependency. So we need to know what are the factors that make people become um, dependent from independent and try and intervene with those because we can do it at this low level but there's a possibility of reversal here but there's no possibility of reversal really when you get to medium levels of dependency it's very difficult to go back and it's certainly not possible um, from the 24 hour care that's evident from the um, from the data so the final take home message is last slide, um, is that, that compression or expansion depends crucially on the underlying health measure. In England we're going to um, see um, an expansion really of disability or dependency that the gains in, in years uh, free of disability or dependency are not keeping gains, not keeping um, 
up with the gains in life expectancy. Using this combined measure is, is a, a more explicit measure of what care is required. Sorry about the typo here. Um, and the future trend in dependency-free life expectancy suggests that the picture looks quite promising for men, um, but this is going to be a continued expansion of low level dependency for women, and we can talk afterwards about why that might be, um, and I can give you some examples. So I'd just like to say, um, I acknowledge the thanks of my colleagues in Newcastle um, for, for their role in these projects. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you very, very much. Uh, I do love this crystal ball, fortune teller type of thing, and I already put down for that 10 questions for you. Uh, but that, let, let me save that a bit for the Q&A section. But for now, any quick clarification, definition uh, type of, of question that anyone may like to have the clarification from? Okay. So if not, then let me move uh, on to the next presentation. Uh, we have an honor from Professor Sherin Hussein from the University of Kent. She would be sharing with us this morning uh, a presentation on older people health and care needs in the Middle East. Um, I'm going to try now to bring the two things that we've been talking about today. So population aging in the Middle East and also looking at the health uh, of the older people. Um, so it's slightly different. Um, this work brings in uh, some previous studies and some publications and also some case studies uh, in the region where we did quite a lot of in-depth qualitative work. Um, and I will be also looking at the client policy information. So I guess because uh, Uh, not, Middle East is the uh, definition is very variable and you don't know where to cut the boundaries. So basically I'm using the Arab world as a starting point, so the 22 countries in the League of Arab States. Um, and this is a map uh, in Arabic and English, just to <laughs> make it a little bit of um, and, and this region provides very nice similarities but a lot of variability of course. So there are some common languages well, mainly Arabic, but with different variations in French in some regions. Um, similar religious code uh, and norms and culture to some extent, there are some heritage. Um, and there are, in that context, there are lots of similarities in the kind of aging and the family and the kind uh, of obligations and the duties afforded downwards. Um, but even when you look at the region, they might be more similar to the sub-region. So for example, the Gulf region, there might be some similarities, Lebanon and Jordan, or North Africa. But there are huge variabilities as well. So we're talking about uh, the countries, at the country level, the poverty within countries, the poverty level, the per capita income, um, the size of the population, so you have like, very populous countries like Egypt, you've got very small countries, uh, like uh, Jordan in terms of the size of the population. And also uh, the literacy, unemployment, and women kind of uh, <coughs> kind of indicators are quite different. Uh, migration is a big thing within the region, but I'm not talking here about migration, but this is a very important thing to bear in mind. Uh, internal migration, but also international migration, um, and the Gulf region, of course, um, you know, we can talk about migration a lot. We all know the transition, demographic transitions, but for the sake of people, there are different things in play in terms of mortality and population growth. The, the first stage and the second stage of population transition. So I'm not going to spend time here. Uh, but using the traditional kind of chronological age, uh, population aging, there are population aging happening in the region. And it's happening in a very interesting way, um, and in some countries in a very fast way. And the reason I put the previous slide about fertility, I'm going to visit that back because it's really important to know where the fertility was at one point in time. And these large cohorts 
uh, are growing older, so there is a pressure point uh, that occurring. Um, so this is some uh, kind of information of which countries seem to be fasting at a higher age, uh, at a higher rate uh, than others. And of course, you know, um, we're seeing life expectancy going up within the whole region. It's not catching up uh, as much with uh, European countries or, for example, Japan. But there are definitely um, an increase, and we will look at some differences by, uh, by, by a specific countries. But why it is unique? Why um, the situation uh, of aging in the region is different from what happened in Europe, for example? So you can learn uh, similar lessons. And I think for a number of reasons, from a demographic, also from a, a kind of a social structure uh, point of view, so from a demographic point, uh, the, the, the countries, many countries are experiencing both the youth vote, as we heard yesterday, and population aging. That would be a wonderful opportunity, but if you do not harness that from a policy perspective, then you've got like, um, a lot of pressure from two, uh, from two parts of the population. But maybe the most striking thing is the time that it will take for the population to age is relatively very short in terms of policy making. And it's very, very short compared with the experience that we've seen in the world. So, for example, in Europe and many of OECD countries, uh, it took between 50 to 150 years really to have the full population aging process. And we're talking about um, a, a much compressed time frame between 30 and 40 years in the region. So that, that really needs policy attention. And we're talking here about policy practice that help to push this message uh, forward. And also there are a lot of other socio-demographic changes happening, particularly um, kind of movement and uh, the traditional kind of co-residency model, um, enable participation, migration, uh, and proximity of residency. When you think about uh, the needs of all the people um, and, the, and the structure of the care system. So this is just to give you an overview of the whole uh, country, the 22 countries. So I just brought it we just brought in the total fertility rate against the life expectancy. And we also looked at any measure that we could find to tell us how the country is prepared for any type of care as a system. And we could find uh, palliative care development index, uh, which is called the Atlas of Palliative Care. And that basically uh, looked at the whole country and saying we don't know any activities about that or there is some capacity building or localized, and then there is another group advanced, but none of these countries have this advanced. There is an argument that palliative care is not the best, but it is one proxy, um, because it's obviously end of care, need, end of care, care need, no kind of end of life care, and uh, this is very much uh, culturally sensitive, so maybe, maybe you can argue that countries really want to invest in that, but it's just an um, And what we find here that, um, you can see that you know there are huge variability in both the life expectancy and fertility rate, but there is a kind of a, almost a straight line uh, linear relationship, uh, and, and, and just shows maybe where their position within the, the state of the demographic transition. But what was also interesting that you know we've got some very high fertility uh, fertility rates. Um, Lebanon is coming out signaled out a lot in, a, in, in, in many of our studies that a country with very low fertility rate, total fertility rate, and quite high life expectancy. Um, but when we look at, uh, and you've got a cluster here in the middle, uh, and, but when you look at palliative uh, care development, we couldn't really see a clear link whether you are, it's very, I call it a whole country, with a high a life expectancy, you have a better or more developed high spirit. It doesn't work in this way. And from the qualitative work we did, it's really grassroots activities that count. So if it's um, charitable organizations that are kind of uh, taking this on work, and you find like um, the, the better one is like the, the brief uh, triangle, um, you find, you know, Georgia, you find Iraq, you know, you buy Djibouti, so it's, it's very, it doesn't make sense much. Um, it's not country level, it's not policy, it's more of uh, grassroots activities that is taking place. 
And then we try to look more at gender, so we looked at the gender inequality index that has, uh, everybody knows it's the, the higher the index, the worse, which uh, uh, is not a good thing. You know, the, the, uh, the, the, the cost of gender inequality. And we put it against another measure of population aging, traditional measure, also proportion of population age that's the more, and against female women participation. We were trying to see um, if there is a, you know, kind of, if we have some indicator of an environment, what is going to happen. Um, and there are some, um, so there is, a, it starts with a linear kind of, uh, almost a linear kind of direction, then it's like flat, flat route. Um, and again, the, the situation with the GII is uh, like some countries, ranges from quite a, a medium to uh, kind of very high in some countries like here in Yemen and it ranges usually from 2.1% to 73.3%. Um, and again we, we really didn't quite think so, we we're just we're trying to link things together uh, but um, it's not, you know, we have some information about the kind of a relatively young population of the Gulf, but with high level of uh, labor participation. And what's interesting here in Egypt, because we did some case studies, that Egypt has an interesting scenario. So you've got a high proportion of population aging, and you have um, relatively um, high labor participation, especially when we think about the informal care. But you have very high inequality, gender inequality. And if we um, we know that women are the in the vast majority are the, the those who provide care both for the young and for the older with any care needs, this is a really um, difficult scenario for women in, in, in that situation. Then we try to see if there is some relationship between uh, the the health services and life expectancy in the region and we had a proxy measure um, in terms of uh, the number of positions per uh, thousand and we tried to use just indicators from uh, different uh, international databases. And, and there was some kind of sorry. Um, So that there is some, you know, that there, really, there is a relationship between, um, you know, you have better a proxy of how like for water occurs, you've got better kind of life expectancy, and we also have this palliative care uh, indicators. Um, and of course, um, what again, what we see that not necessarily that you're having more positions, that you're having more developed palliative care. So there is a separation from happening with the um, and we looked down here about kind of the, the health uh, expenditure per capita. So how much the country invests in health, and how much that relates to the life expectancy that we observe. And we tried to do a kind of a model-based clustering, kind of expenditure model of clustering. And um, you would expect that yes, uh, there is a relationship. So there is a group cluster here. Uh, which I, uh, they're called Somalia, uh, Yemen, uh, Djibouti, where a lot of poverty, not not um, investment in health, and, and it's really, they have very low life expectancy. Um, but then it's not a linear relationship. You've got like, yes, when you go to reach a certain point of investment, you improve the, the average life expectancy of the majority population. But then, it doesn't go in the same line, so it's not the more you invest, the better health. There are other factors in play, um, and there are outliers. So, Lebanon is one of the very interesting examples. So, the investment uh, level is, is quite below the, the other group, uh, but yet the life expectancy is quite high. And also, the, the, the size of, of the LFs is very broad, which means that there is a lot of heterogeneity. So the take home message from here that yes, you need to uh, invest in you know as a country you have to invest in 
health and you have to look at what you, the systems in place, but there are other um, kind of um, structural, socioeconomical and healthy lifestyles and this is where qualitative work needs to be done and understand what is happening. Um, so in the region, the health and epidemiology, the, the picture is not uh, very good really. There are some pockets where, uh, for example, in the Gulf of the Quake, for example, diabetes is, is extremely high. It's something like 60% of the older population um, have type 2 diabetes, which is really, really high. Um, and similarly, from the limited data we have, um, the, the prevalence of non-communicable disease are quite high. Um, there, um, dementia is, is not really studied in the region and like cognitive impairments, but there are very small uh, localized um, studies which indicate that there are certain problems, but um, uh, there is a lot of uh, kind of negative awareness and accurate measures to pick this up. So these are just uh, some figures to uh, back what I was saying about uh, different types of disability. Um, and again, you can see that countries have different, um, there is different pictures of, uh, you know, kind of tough accidents and, uh, and the, the disability. The, the next slide, similarly, uh, if you look at the life expectancy and kind of healthy life expectancy, um, the region is very variable. The message here that we're dealing with a very heterogeneous uh, region. Um, and again, uh, Morocco, for example, comes up as an example with uh, high stability among the older population. Uh, and we need to understand well, why, why is that? Is that the lifestyle? Is that uh, hazardous work? Or what exactly is going on? I'm going to talk briefly, quickly, I've got two minutes, uh, about the long term care kind of, uh, system. Uh, because this is one of my uh, policy interests. Um, and really there is no, uh, well, there is, there is not much system. But in general, we have um, two parallel systems uh, across the world. So you've got the family is helping, and you've got the, the state uh, and the kind of things, the structure, the services and formal. Um, and there are some evidence that there are some formal activities are happening. Again, it's very much charitable based. It's like mainly religiously based. There is Lebanon and Egypt come as examples where um, the, there are certain groups go do mobile visits at homes, they are volunteers, doctors, um, but they're very, very popular of good stuff, but they are not really uh, linked together or uh, as a whole population. There is some private residential care, very expensive, uh, but the data um, is not very good to understand how many people make use of all these uh, residential care and what's the quality and, and what's, you know, do they provide independence or address the place be there. However, the, in the majority, it's a family business. So it's, it is the family that we'll talk to. And the big problem is that the family is not there. <laughs> you know, that, that's, a, that's a really big issue. Um, but it's, it is this quote that you have um, a strong ideology that it, you know, helping each other. Um, and there's some attention, we have to say, um, that there are some recent uh, kind of policy attention and national strategies being put in place and consultations and then the proof of the pudding really, whether these will be implemented and evaluated and, you know, seen on the ground. So I've been told that to time out. So this is my summary point. The, the summary point is that population aging is happening, whether, you know, obviously this is a very basic kind of traditional thinking. Um, it's happening uh, at a fast pace in some countries, very scary pace, when you get 13 years to go from 7% percentage to 14% of the proportion of older people. Um, people living longer, but not free from disease, and there are significant uh, permits of disability. Um, there, there are very small uh, <coughs> studies to look at this. Uh, things like mental health, uh, dementia. Um, so I'm going to move to moving forward, really. Um, this I couldn't um, talk about, but the perspective and expectations of grown older is changing in the region. When you talk to older people, what you want to do, uh, where do you see yourself? And this is uh, an important thing. 
Um, and maybe they were expecting to spend time with the grandchildren, but the grandchildren are not around. Um, I want to just quickly talk about gender because I didn't talk about it. Uh, marital and neutrality patterns are so different for men and women in the region. So you've got a very high proportion of all the women living alone as we did before the wars, and the life expectancy, of course, is different. But remarriage rates um, among men is higher. So you've got a lot of the loneliness going on. Uh, migration uh, is a problem, so people live away from their children or from their families. Um, and uh, stereotypes and stigma. So if you have someone uh, who's an HIV or parent, uh, that can be really problematic. Um, and if you don't have an outside support, you see really horrendous, some horrendous examples of so people looking their parents in rooms when they go to work because they can't do anything. So it's real issues here. Um, and just a word about uh, you know, community capital and inequality. So your social capital is strong as you grow stronger about the equality, our play, education, class, disability. Um, we need to work together and we need to invest in data to understand because we need to, to, to invest in workforce and kind of investment in the system and the service. So some references and thank you very much and we're finally to have any questions. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, this is a very helpful and thought-provoking presentation, like uh, all the three. Uh, before we proceed into the uh, Q&A session, any quick uh, question or comment uh, for clarification or definition in the study? Okay, so uh, please allow me to move into this uh, Q&A section and I and I think we're doing pretty well uh, on like timing, so we have about half an hour or so. Uh, so uh, let me take this advantage, since I'm moderating this, and I would give credit to Professor Decker here. Uh, I really like your Christopher Fortune uh, Taylor kind of thing, right? And then uh, I, I would love to add this to three work experts here on the panel, but I also like to uh, send this question to someone like Professor, my favorite Professor uh, Sergei Chabov as well. Uh, we're talking about measuring uh, population aging here, right? And Professor Sergei come up with this like redefining uh, measurement and indicator and things like that. When we talk specifically about the SDG3, right? Health and well-being, right? We know that health and well-being seem to change a lot from the past 50, 100 years ago until now, right? And we're pretty sure that the world is changing rapidly, right? So my question to uh, three of you first, and then we love to open the floor to all the experts here is, what do you think could be a good way to measure health and well-being in the next 10, 20 years in the future because health and well-being could change a lot, right? Let me give you an example, right? Uh, it's not just the longevity, but it's also this robot and technology and innovative thing that could change the way we see and feel whether we have good health or not, right? The definition of health could be changing, right? And also, uh, well being could be changing. So, what should be a, a good way to look at this? And uh, I'm not sure that can we come up with something as a composite score thing that we'll be able to look at health and well being, which seem to be very complex thing, right? Uh, but that's not a good reason not to measure it, right? Yeah, okay, so Professor Jekka said you are the one who became with this crystal ball, right? You may be the one who okay. first addressed this. I, I might live to regret the crystal ball, I can say. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of composite measures um, because I think they're difficult to interpret. Um, they're particularly difficult to interpret for a non-academic audience. Um, but I don't think there's a single measure 
the past. So I think as WHO are, are, are doing, they're, they're taking, you know, a sort of range of, of measures. Um, and they're trying to put those together in, in a competitive school. Um, and, and that might be great for comparing countries, but I don't think it means very much to an individual. Um, you can tell I'm not a huge fan of frailty schools. <laughs> um, I feel they're a bit like soup and it's been there. And it's difficult to, to translate what the score of it actually means. And that's why we came up with our dependency measure, because it, it, it's more, you could, you could describe it better in, in terms of what somebody needs and maybe what somebody has to plan for. That people are uh, checking up for the call to do something said, I think that resonates with what I thought as well. In the sense that if you be focused a lot on trying to come up with just one number, one score, right? Maybe maybe a very difficult thing to communicate this yes, with people and also with policy makers, right? Because that score of 0.72514, what does that really mean, right, in terms of like I think the discussion, there are different things, so there is the health and the wealthy, and I think one of it is objective, more objective than the So I do agree with Carol that, you know, in terms of health and planning and service and care needs, you have to have something to reach that help you have a need. I kind of like comparing things, I like to see things um, and compare over time and across. And um, well-being is a huge issue, and I know there is a lot of development um, at the and um, WHO, and they have different dimensions, um, and it's, it leads to participation, it leads to how you feel about yourself, if there's some sort of difficulty in your ability to do things. Um, if I put the hand of the Middle East on, um, I would say there was a lot of groundwork to be done first, to understand what will be, um, particularly will be, um, as an older, as an older person, as an older woman, or as an older man, um, and to understand what does it really mean to you, to that person, um, and then collectively. So there is a lot of work um, and, and grounds to be to be covered. Um, and, and in the future, as you say, um, there will be robots, there will be things. It will pass all of these things, but it's not going to replace. So for example, when we think about migration and mobility, so technology did do bring people together. I think can talk to people much more easier. So at the other end, um, your mum or grandma will be better. To, uh, there will be, she will feel better about she seeing you. Um, so it makes that difference. It does not replace, but it, it, it has a lot of things. Um, and it's, as a principle, you can only kind of measure what you think that is going to change. You can never um, account for things that you cannot change. And this is why simulation will be a compete and then act variables and you can add things as, as you go and improve your, your estimation. So I think the concept of all being a very interesting concept and in some regions it needs a lot of exploration. So the idea of uh, duties and uh, norms and, and whether that puts pressure on people in a way because you can't really fulfill it or whether it can be taken. So there is, there is a lot of work to be done particularly in, in, in the region of the um, expanding to, of course, you know, religion, Indonesia, Pakistan. Think about the, the strong religious call. What does it really entail the relationship of the air condition and what the people with people? Uh, and the guilt that all well, well, grandparents sometimes feel guilty that they can't do what they're supposed to do because they're not feeling very well to look after the grandchildren. And the guilt of the children can come out of their grandparents or stigma because they can tell the other people that they can't look after the it's very complex and very cultural sensitive. And um, although that there is um, um, kind of value of looking at kind of things globally and um, major events and care, I think there are regional work to be done and natural work to be done in the local and local area. Thank you. And uh, was a
sorry. The definition of health, well-being. Uh, I think the some of the history is that we want to meet the way from a deficit model. I think yesterday also we're talking about functional ability rather than disability. Although when it was presented, it was also the the functional disabilities, not the abilities. I don't know. Well, and the intrinsic capacity and. Uh, we have the care needs, now it's a deficit model also again. So uh, we have also the happiness, the Bhutan, as part of well-being. So what, what is, uh, it's very difficult. The quality of life, the WHO approach to include well-being. So not looking at only the deficits, but looking at the positive uh, abilities. Uh, so, but I think we still, what we do is we focus still on the deficits, many of our assessments, so, and then I think it's important to not only look at the deficits, but look at the abilities as well, at least, so that's uh, both. Thank you. Uh, so please allow me to open this. Very the, the same question, right? Uh, let me repeat the, the question one more time. Uh, with the development, right, in the past, let's say 30, 50 years ago, right, health and well-being evolved, right, as a as a concept and idea, evolved a lot, right, until today in 2019. And then uh, we know for sure the world is changing rapidly, right? So in the next 10, 20, 30 years, the the concept and idea about health and well-being could could change, right, in a significant way. Uh, example would be this robot, technology, innovation, and also like, we're not talking about health in terms of disability or uh, loss, right, from the ground, but we might get into this enhancement of health that could be enhanced by technology and things, right? So how we might see this, Professor Luz, please. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm raising my hand because this is a uh, question that is of special interest to me for the last year I've been working with a new of these uh, ERC advanced projects and maybe when the project comes to a conclusion in four years we're going to have another conference on this topic uh, here, uh, like the one that is concluding Sergei's ERC project. So let me start with uh, the question, do we need one indicator, composite indicator or lots of specific indicators? In short, the answer is it really depends on the purpose, what you want to do with the indicator. We are here sort of discussing the, uh, not just health and well-being, but I would say more broadly human well-being, of which health is one important dimension, but not the only dimension. And we are seeing this in the context of the Sustainable Development Goals. Now, uh, as you may know, the UN has a long list of indicators. There are the 17 goals. There are 169 more specific targets. And then there are 244 indicators defined. They have been, after some work, reduced to 232. But still, this is an incredibly large number. And how can you monitor whether the world is making progress in the right direction if 167 indicators go in one direction and the others in another? So you really need, in not just seeing the trees, but you need to see the wood, you need to see the big picture. And in particular, what is of interest for me is trying to understand uh, sort of the determinants. Uh, maybe you could say even a well-being production function. Sort of what are the factors leading to improved human well-being? And, and then you cannot have a large number of variables on the left-hand side uh, of this function. You need to somehow find a composite indicator. So we've been struggling, reviewing the literature. There have been. Yeah, more than 30 to 40 different indicators recently proposed, uh, some more on the economics based, others more on subjective well-being, others more health-based and uh, survival-based. So our proposal that we came up with, and I just wanted to inform you about here because it's really trying uh, to synthesize much of the work that's in the field, we call it years of good life. So it is, in a way, based on a life table. It's, and, uh, it's based on survival, understanding that the basic prerequisite 
for enjoying any quality of life is to be alive. Seems plausible. <laughs> Uh, but then, uh, and, and then we have objective as well as subjective uh, components. The objective are three ones. It's the, two of them are sort of uh, health related. It's being physically and cognitively above a minimum level of functioning. That's very much what we've just uh, heard in, in some of the presentations before. But then also we have the economic one of being out of absolute poverty. And that's also important for looking at the aging, like are the aged really in absolute poverty or out of absolute we don't want to know how much above absolute poverty they are, but at least above a certain threshold. So these are the objective indicators that also correspond very much to uh, the Amartya Sen's capability framework. He has these three dimensions that are also then reflected in the Human Development Index and so on. And then I think we must also include some subjective well-being, because people have so different aspirations, they have different values, and they can best judge themselves whether they are satisfied with meeting their own aspirations or not. So life satisfaction is a nice way of covering uh, this whole uh, uh, range of different values, a different way that people appreciate as being important in life. So you also, and fortunately, many surveys have life satisfaction questions. So uh, a year is only counted as a year of good life, in a life table at every age and in gender if you're both on these objective indicators above a critical threshold and on subjective well-being or life satisfaction above the critical value. So that's an attempt, I'm going to kind of show you more about this later, but this is directly answering to the question that you posed. Thank you. Thank you so much. That, that made me think uh, a little bit further on that. Uh, different generation might have different expectations, right? So. Uh, don't put this in a, in a completely wrong way, but uh, the younger generation, uh, many people say they might be more difficult to please, right? Then the satisfaction score might have that component, that influence as well, right? Uh, so in, any other thought before we open? Yeah, please, open the whole floor. Is this all? Yes. Um, thank you very much for the very interesting presentations. Um, my name is Janice Sullivan. I'm from the University of Queensland. Um, my question is Carol, and thank you for those graphics which are really um, very informative and speak to the, the value of disaggregating. <laughs> um, but they raised three questions for me, and the first is that you didn't present the baseline, so we're looking at you know, 0.9 years extra high care for men compared with what now? Is this a doubling or is it, you know, or a small increase? And then I thought it would be valuable to know the client carer ratios for each of those categories to know what this change means in terms of the care workforce. Um, and the third question was, is the increase in high care need because we're avoiding deaths? I mean, if we look at the heterogeneity of people's life course, is it because we're avoiding the sudden deaths in the early 70s and those people that then experiencing the same course of morbidity that people currently experience when they die at 90? You know? Or are we seeing um, a generally lengthening of um, the morbidity of, of all of those categories of people. Uh, good, good question. I'd uh, like to make sure that I'm following the, the order of my boss here. So I think we would like to do this in a few rather than I'm buying time for our speaker here to think and prepare and respond as well. So is this okay if I check? like uh, three questions and then we do is like uh, in a rounded format okay so the, the next one please yeah. Cindy ready? yeah please I, I have a, a, a yeah, yeah good morning Sanderson I have three I have questions for each of the presentations uh, let me just start with uh, the, the last one Professor Hussein uh, she just mentioned at the end that aging was going to be very scary in terms of being advanced. 
I just want to note that this is based on the old conventional measures. And I think we need to say this now. There are different ways of looking at aging, and perhaps we ought always to say, well, aging looks scary based on the old way of thinking about it, but perhaps not so scary based on the new way to think about it. And I choose to present it old way or new way for this particular reason. I, I think that would be good. Uh, also, I think it's very tricky to present uh, the relation between market expenditure and health expenditures. Because health expenditures are not, uh, that's something that's measured in money terms. That's not actually a uh, quantity. Right? And so there are lots of reasons why these things measured in money terms may not transmit into market expectancy. So I, I, I think one just needs to be a little bit more cautious in the kinds of, of, of uh, the kinds of things that, that, that you present that way. We just looking at them in, in a very rough way is it's just a brief overview, but it, it doesn't give us really the information we need. With regard to Carol Yeager's paper, I, I love the uh, material at the end on, on care need. And, and I was struck by the difference between the forecast for men and, and, and women. And I was just wondering whether there are patterns of, of health behaviors that perhaps go in waves that are perhaps not taken into account in the simulation. So perhaps women, perhaps there was a wave of, of smoking for women that came after the wave for men and that if one assumes that the uh, transitions are just going to be in the future what they were in the past, one may possibly miss some of these pattern changes in, 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 in health behaviors. I don't know if that's the case or not, but I really like the, the health need material. And with regard to the paper on South Africa, what I noted was very big standard errors on the coefficients. Uh, so I would not be so fast to say there's no difference. Uh, I think that what, what the statistics show is something that, that suggests we should be more modest. With, with the data that we have, we can't tell that there's a difference when there's such a big, big standard errors. And that may be because of some statistical problems which may be worth investigating further. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, uh, two weeks ago, it was Health Week uh, in Africa with the uh, AUC Summit, and we discussed the issue of uh, the involvement of private sector in improving healthcare, uh, access to healthcare uh, in entire Africa. Uh, so I, I have a question to Carl about um, uh, about the, uh, the rural urban differences. What we we did a background paper in support of this uh, Health Week, and uh, we, we utilized DHS data from um, uh, 40 plus countries in Africa. And uh, around 21 of them had uh, longitudinal data, so a, a few data points in DHS. Now, we completely missed uh, uh, you know, those above 49, but uh, what we found is that over time, the disparities between rural and urban areas in terms of access to healthcare, this was largely uh, child health and maternal health, they were improving. So I was wondering if there's any indication that over time, access to healthcare uh, among the age group that Carl is investigating, is there any evidence that there could be some improvements uh, for the access on the uh, rural side? Thank you. So, thank you. So for those of you uh, who would like to ask me, uh, is this okay that we hold a question uh, for the second round so then we can uh, make sure that everyone still remember the question uh, at the moment? So, Shall we begin with Mr. Tucker? Yeah, I think that remembering the questions is the tricky one. Um, uh, so, Jack, I don't have the things off the top of my head, but if you go to the publication, you will have the separate ones. And ironically, I have presented them as 
the joint bars uh, next to each other is a pass. Um, but provision is not included um, yet in Paxton. Um, our results feed into another model, a macro simulation model by the people who provide the college to Tennessee to determine um, the cost of care and cause uh, the uh, care uh, distribution that we have. Um, but I am thinking about the next version actually pulling that in because it's in some of the uh, studies. Um, in terms of, the, so I can give you a firm answer um, or a firmer answer in, in terms of whether that increase in high dependency is just because the, the living longer, basically, um, uh, 20 years later. Um, and effectively it is, a lot of this is driven by the population age 85 and over because that's where the time intensity care needs are really coming. They're not that evident lower down. Um, I'm looking at partial health expectancies now by age to be able to, to see that a bit more clearly. Um, but, but basically the uh, dependency, and this sort of answers uh, Warren's question a bit as well. Um, the the uh, health behaviours drive the diseases, drive the dependency. And uh, a paper that we published at the beginning of last year for the model, the first paper looked at multimorbidity, and there's going to be a big increase in multimorbidity, particularly in the years spent with four or more diseases. And that is, again, predominantly because of the growth of the population age 85 and over, because all these diseases are age-related, and if you get older, you're more likely to have more of them. Um, but there is a, a worrying trend that some of the new entrants into the older population have a bit more disease than the previous cohort. So that and that's driven by obesity, uh, less by smoking. I, I mean, yes, it might be different for men and, and women, but those would be in because we have the smoking history of those people. And unless you believe that that would affect the transition probability difference, um, then it is Yeah, I'm just going to um, link to Carol because uh, I want to post some uh, I have a lot more for you have done a lot of work in the market and also just to confirm that there is um, a kind of a, another simulation world where the whole cost of care is looked at only the, the ratio but uh, what else is entailed. Um, Warren, um, Professor Sanders, thank you very much for the comments. I think um, of course it is on the traditional measure and it's not scary but it's something that's something that hasn't and um, when you have a system that is not prepared for that in terms of retirement, social protection, um, social inclusion, older people facilities, um, kind of the community support um, and within a structure that is changing, um, the whole um, sociographic structure is changing as well um, with people and migration trends. Uh, that's an issue that needs awareness. So in somehow in the within policy, it's important to say, to say it this way, that there is something happening, we need to think about it from a policy level um, and try to prepare at the window of opportunity to care, the rhythm of opportunity, uh, but it's not that, you know, that is not a long time, it's longer for some countries than others. So I think there is a, a kind of a, a purpose in doing it in, in such a way when you speak to um, a kind of policy makers and try to do something on the ground Uh, health expenditure per capita, of course, this is an amount of money and it's a very crude figure to try to summarize a large number of countries. I'm trying to think if there is any relation, and of course, health expenditure um, is not necessarily for the age group, but it, it is a proxy, like they use the, the, the ratio of positions to the population. 
Uh, and it does so show something that if you are starting from a, uh, a very bad position like some countries, uh, when you invest more uh, country, there is a movement. Uh, of course, the causality is, you know, we can't assess that they're coming from the same kind of point. So, but again, it just uh, opens the discussion that yes, you need to invest in health and, and health services, but there are other things that you need to think about. And it's just an opening um, for more kind of intent um, one of the problems with the region is that we lack data, like data, individual data, level of data, so um, And I think in the next few years, that's what we hope to try to push that um, and try to look at the other sources. There is um, the DHS in Egypt um, has a module that bought for older adults, so that we know the new tech because we know how important it stops. But I think there is an opportunity to look at that in more detail. There are some small studies that are trying to acquire data for them and, and try to do them carefully. So I appreciate uh, exactly what you're saying, but there is a, a purpose behind uh, trying to visualize something for the policy audience. Uh, thank you very much. The first was on the maybe uh, the differences between rural and urban maybe related to large uh, but there's no differences because of large standard errors where we agree that is uh, probably an issue uh, to look uh, into. I want to add that um, there is another dimension, particularly in South Africa, but in many other countries as well, that um, uh, Islam, or in South Africa, we have the so-called informal settlements. The, uh, the population living in informal settlements is higher in the urban areas than in the rural areas although they exist in the rural areas as well. Uh, but when we analyze it, we, the sample size are quite small. That's another <laughs> problem. But uh, so that disguises urban rural differences because we have large slum areas in the in the urban setting and all the others living in the urban setting. So that's another issue that's to look at. Uh, the issue about the healthcare access um, well, I, I, we had also yesterday a presentation about the DHS in South Africa. They looked at the, uh, the age difference, I mean, the, the lack of access to healthcare uh, uh, for the older age compared to the other groups. So, I see, well, I see that uh, we, we have a paper on this. I can't remember now exactly. <laughs> Uh, because this paper, I only looked at health status and uh, chronic conditions, not on healthcare access, uh, urban rural differences. So um, we have another paper on this, I have to check <laughs> what we find on there in terms of rural urban differences, in, say in the six countries uh, on healthcare access. Uh, thank you. So. Uh Stephanie, is it okay? Let me do a quick round of like two questions I saw. Like uh, two people would like to uh, ask this uh, question as well. Yeah, please. The microphone, please. <laughs> no, I think in the front. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, please. Just like to make sure that we also would like to ask. He gives me the floor because I complained this morning that there was a slight gender bias here. <laughs> anyway, two very brief points. I think I enjoyed the presentations. I'm, I'm, I'm also happy that we have a gender dimension. And when we look at aging, we know men and, men and women age differently. And we saw it particularly in, in the last two presentations, which I think is very good. And my second point is so far we have, and I think the, again, this panel finally touched on something, the end of life and the years to death. So, so far we have only, uh, yeah, I think it's good that we celebrated the life years gains and life expectancy that has increased. But what we see in England and what we see in other countries due to chronic diseases and that start much earlier in life and that goes back to the whole approach WHO and of course others as well, looking at aging from a life cycle, from a the entire life course so certain diseases, certain ailments can be prevented if we start early enough and it doesn't start, well you see the symptoms by the age of 60 or 65 or whenever, but 
we lay the groundwork. And I think, again, this calls, and, and I think it's good to have this information. I would say we need to work more to really showcase what, what we now receive at the, at the, towards the end of life, and what the messages are, what do we have to do to prevent it. And I think that's important for policymakers that we can convey that message and say, you know, don't wait until we are 60 and now we have to deal with it. But let's let's think about it the moment uh, we are born in order to really make sure we get quality to the years gained. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I think was two. Uh, so could you please uh, give that microphone to our professor here in the front? Thank you. I would uh, rather not speak because it would be too long and I do not want to cut the break short. So I okay. abstain. Okay, so you can this time be the speaker. Okay, so the last one. Okay, thank you. Um, I just wanted to uh, say that all of the presentations were very interesting and um, in terms of, because WHO was mentioned a couple of times, I have more of a comment that um, we're, we're really trying to separate between what are population-based measures and also what are clinical measures because we know they have different purposes. And um, that being noted on the population side, we are trying our best to look at abilities and a positive approach in terms of describing different components. And I very much agree that in order for have meaningful discussion even at the population level, we will try to we will report each of the subdomains, um, whether it's of intrinsic capacity or functional ability that meet all the criteria we're currently in the process of testing. Uh, an overall score will be calculated, but I agree that that in itself um, is not necessarily helpful, particularly in policy discussions. Um, just two other comments. Um, we certainly think that uh, the determinants um, are not only lifestyle uh, choices, but broader social environmental determinants as well. And uh, we want to make that really clear and we want to document that where we can. Um, and then uh, the issue on care dependence I think, um, as I briefly mentioned yesterday, that's maybe the one uh, indicator where we're going to have a threshold. And I really appreciated the, uh, Carol's presentation on looking at different levels. It's very much what we're trying to do in the new WHO impact framework. And uh, I think uh, further dialogue on, on that particular approach, and I, I saw the references, um, would be helpful. Um, and just a, a comment on the expansion and compression of morbidity, because uh, whether it's expressed as morbidity or as a more person-centered approach uh, uh, capacity, um, it's really important to disaggregate the analysis. We really see that in high-income countries, the rich, there is compression, um, where that's not the case for everyone in a high-income country. In low- and middle-income countries, it's mixed depending on the details of the specific countries. It, it's, um, it's not a simple answer. The question is really important. Um, but it's not the same answer depending on you know, which part of the population you're looking at. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, so, Sydney? Sydney? Yeah, please. So, uh, so, I totally agree with the. This, we have limited socio demographic information uh, uh, in all of those studies. We have to have something that's in the majority of them. Um, so, we can't cover more biological factors, but we've got some social factors in there. Um, but in terms of your inequality, uh, we've just started a, a project which is going to unpick those past trends um, in terms of education and deprivation to see if the same trends have um, uh, been experienced by different uh, social groups. Yes, 
think we are in seven minutes uh, over time. Uh, just like to uh, make sure that uh, it will be okay, right? And uh, I ask the speaker like for like uh, one two minutes to be reminded. I think we don't have time. I think we can uh, uh, do that during the coffee break time. So uh, let let me do this a uh, few sentences uh, reflection on this. I feel like uh, we have been having a very good discussion so far, like from yesterday until this morning and. Most of the way that we look at uh, this uh, issue and ongoing thing, it's pretty much like that was thing, meaning that we come up with a way to measure to say what's going on, right? But I think uh, it would be, would be nice to have more of the framework and indicator to be able to communicate with government and policy maker on uh, what they can do, uh, translating it in, in a nice, simple uh, format, right? And also what they should do. Way to be able to not just say like in identify the problem we have, but also guide them on uh, what they can do and should do. Okay, so then let me conclude and uh, join. Please join me in thanking all the panelists here and everyone here for joining us this morning. Thank you. Okay. We will have a coffee break.